I, I spend a lot of time in the Adirondacks and I love the Adirondacks and I'm outraged that ticks came to the Adirondacks. I never, I always told all my friends down in Columbia, I go on vacation in the Adirondacks, there's no ticks up there. But in the last five years, we keep getting bitten by ticks. So uh, anyway, thank you so much, everybody and and Central New York Lime and uh, SUNY Upstate for organizing this. I'm gonna go quickly into my talk so that I can cover as much as I can before we run out of time. No financial disclosures. I will be discussing off-label use of meds. So this is the talk. I'm gonna talk a little bit about diagnosis, but that's been covered, so not too much. So I'll present some clinical cases, a little bit about mechanisms of disease, a lot on neuropsychiatric manifestations. I'm gonna talk about a nationwide study that we completed and recently published. Suggestions for health professionals, I think, could be useful. And then a little bit about our clinical trials network that we're doing at Columbia, which is new and, and exciting. So you've seen pictures of rashes. It's really only 20% of Lyme rashes that have the bullseye. So most do not have the bullseye. So that's something that people generally don't know. It can look like a spider bite as, as on the bottom right that was actually biopsied and shown to be definitely Lyme uh, infected. If you don't get treated or don't get recognized as having Lyme disease, 10 to, 10 to 15 percent of people go on to develop neurological signs. As you know, meningitis, cranial neuritis, radiculo neuritis, which is the shooting pains, stabbing pains. Later on, months to years later, some patients develop a chronic polyneuropathy, which is multifocal. So you get these weird sensations in different parts of your body, uh, paresthesias, numbness, tingling, burning sensations. Uh, you get radicular pain or you might and or get encephalopathy, which is just a fancy word for brain dysfunction. Uh, and it's usually manifest with cognitive problems. Rarely you might get cerebellar ataxia or a myelitis, a transverse myelitis. You might get weakness and dysautonomia, sensory loss, encephalomyelitis, infl inflammation of the brain. Uh, if you do MRI scans, you might see white matter hyperintensities. We used to do a lot of MRIs with the patients with Lyme disease. Uh, but then we found as, as healthy people get older, 40 and above, you start to have these white matter hyperintensities, uh, just like you see with the Lyme disease. So I tend not to order the MRIs very often, unless there's headaches, in which case you want to rule out other things, or MRI scans for younger people, because if they have white matter hyperintensities, that's unusual. And so you want to pay attention to that. Pseudotumor cerebri-like syndrome, where you have elevated intracranial pressure, can occur and in Europe in particular, but sometimes here in the US, you'll see a vasculitis uh, causing seizures or a stroke. Spirochetes can actually reach the central nervous system quickly, as quickly as two weeks after the bite. So that's uh, unfortunate. 50% uh, of the people may not show central nervous system symptoms at the time. Uh, the impact of the Borrelia infection depends on the strain of Borrelia, whether it's neurotropic, meaning going into the nervous system, the amount of spirochetes that get injected into you from the tick, and as well as the host immune response. Some people have big inflammatory responses, some people have mild responses. And of course, because the central nervous system is a closed body, it's, a, it's somewhat quite sequestered, you need antibiotic treatment that will cross the blood-brain barrier. And as said earlier, culture is rarely done and, and PCR studies have limited value in neurologic Lyme. So here's an individual who came to participate in a study we're doing where we follow people up over two years. They come in with their presentation of Lyme and, and we track them. This was a 35 year old physician and a gardener in central New York. Her initial symptoms were fatigue, irritability, muscle pains, cognitive problems after the tick bite. She had a tick bite, but she did not have a rash. She went to her physician and he said, well, I don't know what this is. And, and she said, but I had a tick bite. And uh, so uh, she struggled with her physician and she was able to get a course of treatment um, when her Lyme test came back positive after it came, came back positive. So she was treated with Doxy and she got 90% better. So that was a successful, both people were happy, the doctor and the, and, and the doctor patients. But then she relapsed and she had this time, she started to have joint pains, stabbing pains, light and sound sensitivity and depression. 
Her primary doc did not know what to do. He refused to treat her further because that's not recommended in the IDSA guidelines. Uh, but she, because she's a physician and she has lots of physician friends, she went to her colleagues and said, please, you know, would you please treat me uh, with another course? Because I was well and, and before this happened, this makes no sense. These are Lyme symptoms. So she got treated. She got better, was well again for another three to four months, relapsed again. And she's thinking, what in the world is going on? Are the patients right who say that there are persistent symptoms and that there are these relapses and that maybe there's this persistent infection? So she got treated again. And this time it lasted and her, her response was sustained. So that raises an important question. The, there has never been a single study that recruited people based on only, let's say, uh, what, what do you do after someone fails their first course of antibiotic treatments? So the guidelines say, don't give another course of, of antibiotics, but there's never been a study that actually tested whether another course of antibiotics would help. So it's hard to know what to do with the guidelines in that context because the uh, data isn't there. So cognitive problems occur. Um, she, she had brain fog, which is a slow processing speed, problems with word finding, and short-term memory issues. They can't remember what they did that morning or the evening before. Children can't remember if they did their homework. They'll go to school. They don't think they did it because they don't remember doing it, and then they get in trouble in school. Other symptoms are common, the light and sound sensitivity. The sound sensitivity can be really intense where they have to wear headphones or ear earplugs because it's so painful. Light sensitivity can be really terrible. So they have trouble going outside or looking outside the window because the light is too painful for them. So they might come in with dark glasses looking really weird and with headphones on. And you can imagine what the physician is gonna think about this patient who looks so weird. Uh, but this is what some of the Lyme patients actually do look like when they go in and they can be quite irritable. So if you're going in and to a physician looking a little weird and you're irritable, uh, it's, it's, not good. it's gonna be a difficult encounter perhaps. And if you have cognitive impairment and you can't tell your history in a logical way, uh, that's also challenging for the doctor-patient interaction. So with the, this doctor, we have to ask, what would have happened if she didn't have connections? If she had, didn't have doctors she could go to, would she have gotten treated probably much later? Forty percent of clinicians in the U.S. do give additional courses of antibiotics for Lyme disease. That was a study that the CDC did. Now, it was widely discounted by the academic community that infection can persist after a course of antibiotic therapy, but now it's widely accepted that that, in fact, can occur. We know that in many, many animal models. So here's case number two called The Bicycle Boy. It was published in the New York Academy of Sciences in 1988 about uh, a boy who presented to the Yale Psychiatric Institute with restrictive eating and OCD type of symptoms. So he, here was a 12 year old boy. He had had four attacks of swelling of the right knee. That was early in the Lyme disease history. So they didn't think about Lyme disease initially, uh, but the diagnosis of Lyme arthritis was eventually confirmed serologically. Uh, and after the last attack, he finally was treated with doxycycline uh, and the arthritis got substantially better. But two months later, he suddenly started to become withdrawn and depressed. He no longer interacted with his friends, spent most of his time alone, would no longer do his schoolwork. He ate very little and began to exercise compulsively. And he lost a lot of weight. So on admission to the psychiatric hospital, he had this diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. And it's unusual for a boy to develop anorexia nervosa. Um, so it made the psychiatrist wonder what else could it be. So they looked into his history. They saw this history of Lyme arthritis. They called in a neurology consult and it was Andy Packner who subsequently became a very famous Lyme uh, researcher in neurology. Andy did a spinal tap and the, both the serum and the spinal fluid tested positive for Borrelia antibodies. So he was given IV penicillin because that was the recommended treatment at the time for several weeks. And he began to eat more, gain weight and communicate with others. And during the following several months, his behavior returns to normal. And on two-year follow-up, he was doing very well. So that's a great save, right? They, the, the doctor actually did the spinal tap. The, the psychiatrist thought about recommending the neurology consult. Uh, 
And it's really interesting that the depression and compulsive behaviors didn't emerge until like two years after the initial uh, or infection. It's obviously a rare cause of compulsive behaviors and anorexia, but it can occur. The spinal fluid proved to be the key here, but he didn't have any other neurological signs. So that's uh, troubling that, you know, because that would have been a clue if he had other neurological signs. So it does ask, raise the question, how many cases of neuropsychiatric Lyme disease are we missing? So that's kind of why I went into this field. I'm a psychiatrist, and I thought this is such an interesting case. Uh, and I was hearing from patients in the community that Lyme disease, in fact, Polly Murray, who was the mother in old Lyme, Connecticut, contacted my wife, who's also a psychiatrist at Yale, and said, you know, you and your husband, you should do something about Lyme disease and study it. And so that's how this whole saga started for us. Was this a case of PANDAS, pediatric autoimmune disorder associated with strep? No, because it wasn't strep, but there's an extension of the pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders called PANS, which refers to other microbes like Borrelia or mycoplasma that also might trigger an autoimmune mediated reaction that causes these sudden onset OCD or tick disorders. So that's just something to remember. I'm not gonna talk further about it, but that, Generally can get treated with antibiotics initially or IV, IG, if the antibiotics aren't working. Diagnostics, you heard a good le lecture, ex a wonderful lecture yesterday by Dr. Paolino. So I'll just add to it that looking at um, skin punch biopsy can sometimes be helpful to assess for small nerve fibers. Uh, because if you have that small fiber neuropathy, sometimes that helps clinicians Consider the possibility that something like IVIG might be helpful. They might push for that or, or work harder to try to document it so that you can get fun immune support. I'm not, not immune. I mean, um, funding support for it from your insurance company. Neuroimaging, I mentioned, so I don't do too much of anymore for patients unless it's, unless it's really indicated. The other blood test that you should consider doing when you're faced with someone who might have neuropsychiatric Lyme certainly is Borrelia miyamotoi, which is something that most clinicians don't test for. Quest has it now, so that's really helpful. Bartonella henslei definitely can cross the blood-brain barrier. It's mainly flea-borne and not tick-borne. I'm not saying it's not tick-borne, but it's mainly flea-borne, and that's how most people get it. And there's some really interesting reports in the literature to, uh, of case studies where patients with Bartonella infection that have been confirmed by uh, PCR uh, who were treated for Bartonella got dramatically better with their neuropsychiatric disorders. And then there was a small case control study of patients with psychosis compared to healthy controls where they looked for, in a blind fashion, looked for uh, Bartonella DNA. And they did, in fact, find a higher positivity rate in the patients with psychosis compared to the healthy controls. It was interesting. It was a small study. It needs to be followed up with a much larger study, uh, but that's, that's fascinating. And then Powassan virus, as we know, is rare, but it can be deadly. So post-treatment symptoms that persist for more than six months and that are associated with functional impairments, that's what the term post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome refers to. So there are a lot of published studies on post-treatment Lyme syndrome. If you don't have functional impairment, you're in the middle circle there where you have post-treatment symptoms. So a lot more patients have post-treatment symptoms, but not necessarily causing impairments. Are there any biological correlates to this illness? And the answer is yes. There, there are immune biomarkers of post-treatment Lyme syndrome that have been Demonstrated in various studies, not everybody has these, but you might have antineuronal antibodies simil similar to what has been seen with lupus. The Harvard group has shown that endothelial cell growth factor antibody is elevated uh, uh, in patients with post-treatment Lyme symptoms, suggesting that there's an autoimmune component to this disease. Uh, inflammatory markers have been identified, IL-6, increased expression of interferon alpha, chemokine CCL-19, and we did a study looking at the CSF of Lyme patients compared to chronic fatigue patients compared to healthy controls, and there was an increase in complement cascade proteins. So there's immunological evidence of abnormality. And on the left bar, the, the um, 
Oh, this is not working this time. It worked before. Anyway, the left bar is post-treatment Lyme patients. And as you can see on the far right are lupus patients, and they have the same level of autoimmune auto antibody reactivity. And then we did a study of brain metabolism to look in the brain is because, you know, early in the 90s, you know, we were struggling because you couldn't really prove that people had something objective going on. So if we could show that there was something going on in their brain using unbiased mechanisms, such as a brain PET scan, uh, that might be helpful. So we were, we had 37 patients with persistent Lyme problems and uh, cognitive impairment. And we looked at their brain metabolism and all those areas in yellow and red are areas of decreased metabolism. And we also looked to see if they could enhance blood flow in their brain as a normal healthy person could, if you have them breathe in uh, air that has enhanced carbon dioxide in it. And if you're a healthy person, you'll have a big increase in blood flow, as you can see in the bottom right, the yellow is all areas of increased blood flow. And there was a less of an increase in blood flow for the Lyme patients compared to the controls. So it seems like blood flow and metabolism are affected by uh, Lyme disease. And then the Hopkins group recently published on the immune cells of the brain, the microglia, uh, and it shows that there's an increased activation in the microglia in the patients with post-treatment Lyme syndrome. So here is the areas of increased uh, microglial activity in those orange areas compared to the healthy controls. So inflammation is certainly seems to be going on with the patients as well. Now I'm talking about psychiatric issues. Uh, this is an anxiety provoking disease. There's so much controversy and there's uncertainty with the diagnostic test because we don't have direct tests of infection. So clinicians and patients aren't sure exactly what to do. And among the patients, it can sometimes generate anxiety and anger. And in the, uh, it's certainly in the media and the popular press, it's known as the Lyme Wars. Now, we did do uh, a study uh, in the early 2000s where we gave two and a half months of IV ceftriaxone, so 10 weeks compared to 10 weeks of IV placebo. Um, Lauren Krupp at Stony Brook did a study where she did one month of IV ceftriaxone compared to placebo for patients with persistent symptoms. So she was focused on persistent fatigue. So all her patients who entered the study had a certain level of fatigue. She had developed a scale by because she previously worked with MS and, and chronic fatigue uh, that measured functional impairment from fatigue. And she, uh, she identified 64% of the patients who got ceftriaxone as being responders compared to 18% on placebo. So that was a statistically significant difference. When she did a sub-analysis on her study, she found that 80% were responders if they were, if they were IgG Western blot positive at the time of entry into the study compared to those who received placebo. So anybody looking at this and this would think this is a reasonable therapy for someone who has persistent fatigue uh, after the first or two courses of antibiotic therapy. We did a different study looking at persistent cognitive problems to see if ceftriaxone works. And it was somewhat effective at the primary outcome of 12 weeks. But if you go out to 24 weeks, we lost, patients lost all their gains. So it was a 10 weeks of treatment and they lost their cognitive gains. So on the primary outcome, it was not effective uh, in terms of something that's beneficial for patients in the long term. But we did find that there was sustained improvement for pain and physical functioning out to six months so on the secondary outcomes. And then the reviewers of our article, as we were trying to get it published in the journal of Neurology, which is where it was eventually published, they asked us, please, Reanalyze your data using the exact same approach Lauren Krupp did in her study. Exclude people who didn't have a certain level of fatigue when they entered the study and tell us what you found. And we found the exact same results pretty much as what Lauren Krupp found. So here was an unintended replication of uh, the earlier study. So the first study you could say, well, it was just a fluke. It may not mean that much. The sample size was small, but our study found some very similar findings, which makes me believe the, her initial findings. 
Do spirochetes persist despite antibiotic treatment? In all these different animal models, uh, it's been shown that the Borrelia can persist despite antibiotics. Uh, oftentimes they persist without causing disease. So you can have spirochetes in the animal models that doesn't mean that you actually are getting disease from it, but sometimes it can be causing symptoms and that's the challenge. So I'm gonna go right into neuropsychiatry now so we don't spend too much time on the other stuff. My most important message of one of them is most mental disorders have nothing to do with Lyme disease, right? It's so important because so many people, just because you have a positive Lyme test doesn't mean your depression or your anxiety or your psychiatric symptoms are due to Lyme disease. So that's just really important because some people will say, well, then I, I should just treat the Lyme disease uh, and not treat the psychiatric disorder, which is I think a big mistake. However, in the literature, there's been very well-documented cases of new onset OCD, panic attacks, mood disorders, suicidality, sensory hyperarousal, cognitive disorders, bipolar disorder, psychosis, and Tourette's. So basically, pretty much any neuropsychiatric disorder that you can think of has been reported as, as, as occurring in patients with very well-documented neurologic Lyme disease, um, and that improves with antibiotic therapy. Sometimes people, however, develop a bipolar type picture, for example, uh, associated with their Lyme disease infection that gets partly better, but then requires, uh, with antibiotics, but then requires ongoing psychiatric medication management to sustain their improvement. So that's really, really important that sometimes it doesn't go away and sometimes it does. Why do people get neuropsychiatric symptoms? Well, it could be because of the CNS inflammation. It could be because of autoimmune mechanisms like in pandas or pans. And it could be that the cir circuitry has been altered. So if the brain neural circuits have been altered by the prior infection, then you need something to correct the altered neural circuitry uh, if the infection is no longer present. And there are certain things we know amplify biological problems like this, such as prior trauma, current stressors, and the anxiety associated with uncertainty. 90% of people who meet criteria for post-human Lyme disease complain of cognitive difficulties. So that's really common among our patients. If you try to measure it, about uh, 7 to 30%, a much smaller percent, actually have objective measurable problems. So sometimes it's subtle and not measurable. So here's an interesting case of a, of a woman, a 55-year-old woman. She was camping with her family. This was, I think, in the scan, one of the Scandinavian countries. And all of a sudden, she started to act very, very bizarrely. Uh, and she started um, talking really fast and having all of these grandiose ideas and, and becoming a little bit delusional. So she was brought to the emergency room, and they admitted her to the psychiatric facility. She was diagnosed as having mania, uh, and they started to treat her for the mania, but then it became clear that she was developing radicular pain and weakness, so they called in neurology. Uh, her spinal tap was not abnormal at the time, but she had these this, she had this clear radicular pain and, and neurologic weakness, and so they diagnosed presumptive neuroborreliosis, which is what they call neurolyme there, and she got dramatically better. Her mania resolved, the radicular pain resolved, and the weakness resolved. And then later, she had a positive test in her spinal fluid eight weeks later to confirm that. And then the next case is an unusual case. A 42-year-old woman presents with new onset schizophrenia-like disorder. So she uh, started out with cognitive problems and irritability and later developed paranoia and hallucinations. But what was unusual is that she was 42 years old. And usually psychotic disorders start around age 15, age 17. So this was atypical. And so they did a spinal tap after eight months and it was a positive for neuroborreliosis. So she was diagnosed and treated and, and her symptoms resolved. So another important message is, is underdiagnosis is problematic if you don't detect Lyme disease when it's there. And overdiagnosis is problematic if, if you're attributing everything to Lyme disease or a tick-borne illness when there's, let's say, a primary psychiatric disorder that is not being properly addressed or a psychiatric disorder that, that got triggered by the Lyme disease and wasn't, isn't being properly treated. 
So there was a nice study done by Afton Hassett, who was a young uh, PhD student working with uh, Len Siegel uh, in a rheumatology clinic in New Jersey. And she, I think, and he were trying to show that patients with chronic symptoms have, may have had significant psychiatric problems that was causing them to have this chronic stuff that they were believing was due to Lyme disease. And uh, what she ended up showing was somewhat different. What she ended up showing was that the pe people who had definite well-documented Lyme disease 45% of them had depression compared to 10% of those who believed they had Lyme disease, uh, but didn't have good documentation of it. So these would be people with medically unexplained symptoms, possibly due to Lyme disease. These are people with very well-documented Lyme disease. So look at that, a fourfold difference in depression. Why would that be? I would have thought that if you thought you had something, you didn't know what it was, you'd be much more likely to be depressed. So I thought that was a fascinating study. We did a study of our patients who came to participate in our Lyme encephalopathy study, uh, 81 adults with well-documented and previously treated Lyme disease and persistent cognitive symptoms. 20% of them reported suicidal thoughts. Now that's not uncommon. People with chronic illness have suicidal thoughts about 20 to 25% of the time. So you have to make sure whenever you're working with someone who's had symptoms for a while that you ask about it. And if there was depression, significant depression at the time, the rate of suicidal thoughts increased to 63%. So a few years ago, I was thinking, do I, have I really shown that psychiatric problems can emerge after Lyme disease? I believe it's true. I know it's true from my gut, but I don't think I have truly shown it because other studies have not found an increased risk of depression. So I thought, well, what's the best way I could test this? And I contacted some colleagues in Denmark, who were like the world experts in uh, mental health epidemiology, and I thought, okay, I'm, let's just have them do it. I'll find, I'll get them the money. They can do the study. It's totally unbiased. I have nothing to do with it. They'll include everybody in the country over a 22-year period, and they'll look to see those who came into the hospital with a diagnosis of Lyme disease were they more likely to have psychiatric disorders after than those who never had a Lyme disease diagnosis. Okay, so what, what, what did we find? There were 7 million people in that study. So a big study. I'm glad I didn't have to collect all those subjects. <laughs> um, and 12,000 of them uh, had been diagnosed with Lyme disease in the hospital. And, and we excluded people who had a prior mental disorder diagnosis. So what we found was that there was, in fact, an increase. So 30% increase in having any mental disorder, a 44% increase in having a depressive disorder, a two-fold or 200% increase in suicide attempts and a 75% increase in suicide. So uh, there is in fact an association between mental disorders and suicide and a serious Lyme disease diagnosis. Now in Denmark, the only their registry only counts people who are diagnosed with Lyme disease in the hospital. So that means you have to go to the hospital, either in the outpatient ER or inpatient setting. So this doesn't mean that everybody with erythema migrans is going to, who, who are treated in the community will get it, um, the psychiatric problems, but the more serious psychiatric presentations seem to be associated with that. Okay, so I already said that. And the risk was increased both for depression and for suicide, the closer you were to the hospital-based diagnosis. So within the first one to three years, uh, the risk was much higher than after that. These results are not surprising. Prior nationwide studies for other infections have in fact shown an increased rate of mental disorders and suicide, such as HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, SARS-CoV-2, strep, toxo, treponema pallidum. We know that peripheral inflammation can lead to depression. So it doesn't even have to be the infection going up to your brain, just could, just could be inflammation elsewhere in the body that can be affecting the brain. So as clinicians, what do I recommend? Monitor your patients for mental health sequelae from Lyme disease, especially during the first year or among those with chronic symptoms. Consider incorporating into your mental, into your screening practice and primary care, a PHQ-9, which is a free self-report questionnaire for depression. If it's elevated, ask them about suicidal thoughts. There's something called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Raise your hand if, if you've ever heard of it. Oh, good. Some people have. This is actually a very useful scale. It was developed by a team at Columbia about 10 years ago. And it's being used all over the world now. The FDA is requiring it for all their trials. Um, 
it's really quite useful. Also remember the new Suicide Prevention Lifeline phone number, which is 988. So if you have a patient with suicidal thoughts, please give them that number so that they can call uh, for help if they're alone at home and, and looking for some guidance. So these are the questions in the, in the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. It's free, you can get it online. Uh, in the last month, have you wished you were dead? Have you had thoughts of killing yourself? Have you been thinking about how you might do this? And then the ones in red or orange here are the more serious questions in terms of increasing the risk dramatically of an imminent suicide is, have you had intention to act on these thoughts in the last month? Have you worked out the details of a suicide plan? Have you started to act on your plan? So obviously these um, ones in orange or red are more uh, serious than the earlier ones. Uh, and for the first three, if someone has thoughts about suicide, you want to make sure that they're consulting with a mental health clinician. You want to make sure you advise them to talk to family and friends. You might bring in their family and friends to have them talk together about it um, if they let you do that so that they're not alone in their thoughts. And then if they have an intention to act or they have details or they start to act, then they need to be seen in the emergency room or evaluated immediately because that's, that's a bit of a crisis. So that's what the scale looks like. And there's a free app. If you write down Columbia Protocol, you can get it later. And then I have it on my phone. It's really easy to use. It's just the six, six questions. Uh, and it's nice to have uh, ready access. Okay, so when should one suspect that neuropsych symptoms may be Lyme related? If a person comes in with multiple system symptoms that emerge after a viral-like illness from a Lyme endemic area, you better think about it. If you don't, that's a big mistake. Um, seroconversion, increased titers, abnormal spinal fluid, of course you would think about it. If the psychiatric disorder occurs at an odd age, like it did in one of the cases I presented earlier, if the person has accompanying verbal fluency problems or memory problems, then you should think about it as well then. Or if the person has no prior history of psychiatric problems and there's no family history, then you really have to look for an underlying other organic medical cause that could be a clue for you. We have a second opinion service at Columbia where people come trying to sort out, is my, are my problems due to Lyme or are they due to something else? And we found that 40 to 50% of the patients have moderate to severe depression. Um, and only about half of those were getting mental health care. So that's, I think, a public health issue. Okay, so how do we treat this stuff? So people have either, they could have persistent infection, they could have immune dysregulation, they could have problems with their brain, uh, or there could be misdiagnosis or co-infections. So you have to look at other causes as well, or they can have a bunch of those uh, overlapping. So therapeutic approaches. If you think they have persistent infection, you're going to give a course of repeated antibiotic therapy. Um, it has been demonstrated in, according to my review of the literature that repeated antibiotic therapy can be helpful. Uh, there isn't evidence, good evidence, quality evidence that long-term antibiotic therapy is helpful. Um, there's a PLEASE trial in Europe that uh, tried to look at that and then they were not able to show benefit from, from longer term antibiotic therapy. Targeting immune activation, at least in the New York City area, a lot of the patients are getting IVIG, intravenous gamma globulin therapy, under the idea that autoimmune mechanisms are at play and that the intravenous gamma globulin can be helpful. Uh, Dr. Katz, who's a neurologist in Connecticut, did a small study of his patients, like 24 or 25 of his patients, Using IVIG, he did skin biopsies before and after treatment. And what he showed objectively was that there was improvement in the small nerve fiber density uh, after the IVIG therapy when it, was, when it was tested again six months later, and there was improvement in the clinical symptoms. And these are patients who had neuropathic symptoms. And he also required that they have evidence of OSPA uh, antibodies uh, on their blood tests. That never was published. It was presented at the American Academy of Neurology, but not published, unfortunately, because he's a busy, busy clinician. 
you could use psychiatric meds to alter neurotransmitter systems. Because what is, what is, does anybody know what central sensitization is? Probably many of you do know. I'll raise your hands just if you do. Yeah, central sensitization basically refers to the fact that, that the brain can get hypersensitized to, the pain pathways can get hypersensitized. So they become more sensitive to minor things like just touching. That can feel like a burning, terrible, horrific pain if you're, pain pathways in the brain are, are hyperactive. So what's helpful about that is that the there are certain treatments that could be quite helpful for that. So like serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, the SNRIs can definitely be helpful. The old fashioned tricyclics like uh, nortriptyline or amitriptyline can be enormously helpful. So I remember seeing a patient in my practice uh, a number of years ago who had, had months and months and months and months and months of antibiotic therapy. And she came in to see me and she says, oh no, I just got another positive PCR. But she, she had had so much prior therapy. I said, well, let's take a break. Uh, you know, so I suggested she take a break from getting more antibiotic therapy uh, and let's do this uh, tricyclic treatment. So I did that. She got dramatically better. Her neuropathic pains phenomenally improved. And so she did extremely well. And then she came off of that about four to six months later and she continued to do well. And then there was a relapse about a year and a half later. So she went back on for two or three months. So periodically she might go back on these treatments. So you don't have to stay on it forever, uh, but it could be enormously helpful. Stress reduction and psychotherapy, I was glad to hear someone earlier talking about uh, coping skills and, and strategies to reduce uh, stress. We find that very helpful for our patients. We have a support group where we teach people's coping skills uh, and they, they love that. Um, physical reconditioning, obviously, and neurofeedback sometimes is helpful for the people who have the hypersensitivity to sound. There are no controlled stu studies of pharmacologic therapy. So this is a big slide here with all these things that might help for fatigue, uh, bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, Modafinil, Provigil, uh, central pain. I mentioned tricyclics, the SNRIs, pregabalin or gabapentin definitely can help. Maybe low dose naltrexone can help. Probably the cannabinoids can help as well. Light and sound sensitivity, gabapentin, cobramazepine, clonazepam can be helpful. Mood dysregulation, which is a huge problem in many of these patients. They have swings of mood and irritability, especially the adolescents. Lamotrigine can be helpful, which is an anticonvulsant, and sometimes the atypical neuroleptics. Usual things for depression and anxiety may be helpful, and attention stimulants and wellbutrin bupropion can be helpful. Sometimes patients say, I don't want to go on any of these brain, brain meds because I don't need them, and I don't have a brain med, brain head problem. Uh, and so what I say is that the Lyme infection sometimes is causing uh, issues that need uh, subsequent treatment, and that could be helpful. And also I convey that many psychiatric meds are used by neurologists and rheumatologists for arthritic pain, neuropathic pain, and so it can be helpful for that. So here's a doctor saying to the patient, the bad news is you have Lyme disease. The good news is I don't believe in that disease, so you're fine. Is the patient fine? No, the patient feels a thousand times worse, right? Because the patient has been invalidated. And we heard about this over the last couple of days. And invalidation is one of the worst things that a doctor can do because it can be so traumatic. They don't want to get help or seek help. They don't know who to see. Uh, and it's, sometimes it's even done by people they trust, doctors who they've seen for many years. So it's, it's unfortunate. We did a study of Kundalini Yoga using group therapy, to, hoping it would reduce persistent pain and, for, and or fatigue. And it did help with reducing overall symptom burden. Uh, it did help in reducing cognitive complaints. It was not statistically significant for pain and fatigue. It was a small sample size study. Uh, maybe a larger study would have shown improvement, but I can tell you the patients really enjoyed being in this Kundalini group. Now, maybe it was just the support of being with one another, but they certainly felt a lot better and wanted to continue it. We're doing a study now of the vagus nerve and vagus nerve stimulation. We're about, we haven't done our first patient yet, but probably the next month we will. Why? Because I called a colleague up and I said, what brain stimulations might be helpful for Lyme patients? And he said, 
uh, go for the vagus nerve. And I said, why? He says, because first of all, when you're treating the vagus nerve, you know exactly what you're targeting. You're targeting the vagus nerve. Whereas, whereas if you do other brain stimulation approaches, you don't know exactly what part of the brain you're hitting. And the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. We know it goes up to the to the serotonin and the norepine, norepinephrine pathways in the brain. It can be helpful for that. And it can also reduce inflammation. So I thought, wow, that's good advice. So he sent me to the best, his best colleague, in the country who's down at uh, Medical University of South Carolina. He said, work with this guy. So I called him up. I said, I know, I know Harold Sackheim. And he said, oh, you know Harold Sackheim? Definitely I'll work with you. And, and here's my protocol. I just finished a COVID study. You use this for Lyme disease and we'll work together. So that's how I got into this. Yeah, he's great. That, Bashar Badran is his name. So there's lots of different ways of, st of stimulating the vagus nerve. You can do surgery, uh, but uh, that's not so pleasant, uh, but it certainly is very direct. Or you could do what's available now and for research is transauricular VNS. And some places you can get it online, which is not, not research-based. Um, and the tragus right there is one of the places where the, where the vagus nerve is and the simba concha right in there. Uh, so if you stimulate those places, you're stimulating the vagus nerve. And isn't it interesting? That's where transauricular acupuncture also uses. So what's been known for thousands of years, we finally know that the vagus nerve is there. And there's a reason why. I, also, I always thought it was somewhat odd that the acupuncturists were saying, oh, this is for your liver. I said, how could this be for your liver? Well, it turns out the vagus nerve goes down to the spleen, it goes to the liver, it goes to the GI tract, it goes to the lungs, it goes to the heart. So the vagus nerve is the longest cranial nerve in the body, basically goes most places in the internal system, and it has a really important role in regulating the inflammatory response. Uh, there's a study that recently is, was published on lupus, uh, and it showed that a, this is a small study, but even if even though it was small, they were able to show that transauricular VNS led to a significant reduction of fatigue and pain. So that was quite interesting. And so that has, is leading to a control, much larger controlled trial now. So the Cohen Foundation very generously gave us a grant to open up this Clinical Trials Network Coordinating Center at Columbia. We've done a lot of clinical trials. We have the School of Public Health right there, and they uh, have led a lot of clinical trials and data managed a lot of clinical trials for other diseases. Uh, I like doing clinical trials because it's taking care of patients and you don't, you're not charging them anything, so that's really nice. Um, so our first uh, group of nodes, meaning the collaborators at other institutions, are John, Al John Alcott at Johns Hopkins and Roberta DiBiazzi, who's the chief of pediatric infectious disease at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. So the idea is that she would do some studies of children. John and I would do studies of adults, and we're looking for additional nodes to join us as well. So the nodes get a certain amount of funding support from our network. And then if they design a specific trial, there's some additional funding support for that as well. So that's the coordinating center. And what are we doing at this point? So at Columbia, we're about to start the vagus nerve stimulation study. That's a simulation, it's not, it should be stimulation. Uh, and we're also going, and that's for fatigue associated with Lyme. Uh, and then for brain fog, we're going to be doing something called transcranial direct current stimulation, which is two patches on the forehead that stimulates uh, the, the frontal part of your brain. And the only reason we're doing that, that study is because Lauren Krupp of the post-treatment Lyme fatigue study earlier, who's really an MS expert, has been doing studies in her group looking at this um, with Lee Charvette on uh, patients with MS and finding it to be very helpful in improving cognition. So, you know, because we're all trying to figure out how to help patients with the cognitive problems and the brain fog, this may be something that's useful. Um, IV ketamine is very useful, profoundly useful for depression and for suicidality. It reverses depression and suicidality within like 24 to 48 hours. So we're going to be uh, doing a trial of that for patients with long Lyme depression. And then uh, John Alcott at Hopkins is doing a study of tetracycline, a three-month study versus placebo uh, for post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Um, and at Children's National Hospital is going to be a really interesting study of Lyme disease and pregnancy where people... So if anybody here has a patient who develops 
uh, Lyme disease during their pregnancy or hears about it on the internet, please have them send me a note uh, or contact the person. I'll have it on my website at Children's National Hospital is doing this study. She's going to be looking at brain volume of the fetus, uh, as well as they're going to be looking at placenta and cord blood and looking, and, and then they're going to follow up the children over one and a half years. So that's a really nice study. Summary. Mood, cognitive problems, suicidal thoughts, sensory arousal are common, screen for depression and suicidal thoughts. Uh, neuropsychiatric stuff can occur early, it can occur late. Most, the good news, I didn't say it earlier, most people improve over time and many people, about a third of the people recover fully. Um, multiple potentially, and that's of people who have been profoundly ill for, for many, many years. So I was really happy to see that. We did a 10-year follow-up study of our Lyme encephalopathy patients. Um, and my main message in the treatment is focus on the most burdensome symptoms. So if it's fatigue, focus on that. If it's neuropsychiatric, focus on that. Uh, if it's pain, focus on inflammation. Don't avoid standard mental health treatment. And there is a lot of hope for the future. People can get a lot better. And thanks. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. Comments, questions? Lunch can wait. Is there any relationship between amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and Lyme disease? That's a good question. Uh, I would say the relationship is extremely weak, if any. Uh, there have been reports of patients who have ALS-like symptoms who actually have been diagnosed with ALS. This, there are a couple of case reports of this that have been published uh, where it was subsequently recognized as Lyme or a complicated Lyme with another tick-borne illness and got treated and got better. But that's quite rare. And there have been studies uh, looking at a series of patients with ALS and, and not finding an increased rate of reactivity compared to others. I've had a, a few patients referred to me for that purpose to see if there could potentially be Lyme because obviously it's that's a devastating diagnosis to get. Um, and even though, the, the, like you said, the, the data is fairly weak, I will oftentimes offer IV ceftriaxone just as a trial because, you know, there's not a whole lot else. Yeah, um, and ceftriaxone has glutamate modulating properties. So it, de it decreases glutamate excitotoxicity, which is, they actually did a big controlled trial of ALS to see if ceftriaxone can help with ALS that's not related to Lyme. And it didn't work out, unfortunately. But, um, but I certainly agree with you. This is a horrific disease. And if it can help, consider it. Um, I, I did have a, another question, Brian. Like in, in terms of some of your patients, I know we use Cymbalta a lot because of the the pain uh, properties that it has, but also the fact that it's an antidepressant. Do you guys use that significantly as part of your... Yeah, Cymbalta is great. It's an excellent uh, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, we did a little study of something called melnasopran, which is another, it's an old serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It was a study we were doing of pain um, and we stopped the study just because uh, we wanted, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of why we stopped it, but we treated three patients. One patient dropped out because he couldn't tolerate not being on his opiates. The two patients who stayed with it really did better with the SNRI. There are one guy, he had arthritis for five years and he said his arthritis suddenly dramatically improved and he was so grateful. Uh, and the same was true for the woman. Her arthritis dramatically improved as well. So that's important to know because it's easy to give and it's safe. Yes. Hi. Um, so in Dr. Rawls book, Unlocking Lyme, he references uh, being able to get Lyme from fleas. And I noticed that you mentioned it in the your presentation as well. Oh, that was for Bartonella. Bartonella, you can so get, you can get Bartonella. Mainly a flea. Yeah, uh, that's a vector for Bartonella mainly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who else? Has, yes. Um, from your experience, uh, how many of the neuroborreliosis uh, patients they are co-infected with Powassan virus? Uh, that's an interesting. Yes, no, that's a really interesting question. How many of the patients are co-infected with Powassan virus? Um, we actually just completed a study uh, that looked at seroprevalence in a large sample of patients who uh, might or definitely had Lyme disease, so from a Lyme endemic area, and it was the results were somewhat comparable to what you saw in a Wisconsin study that the, where the seropositivity was 14%. 
which means that there are people out there, if that's correct, that there are people now, a lot of people out there who are getting Powassan virus infection, who aren't getting very sick from it, uh, which is great news. Uh, so well, anyway. the reason why I'm asking is that, so we have a grad student in the lab trying to understand the correlation between Borrelia burgdorferi infection and Powassan co-infected tick, how it actually clinically, uh, how it is clinically relevant. So our hypothesis is that if, the, if a single deer tick carries both Powassan virus and Borrelia, Powassan virus is delivered to the human immediately upon a tick bite. However, Borrelia takes about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but we know from our own research that within 24 hours, the, the virus will start to enter the central nervous system, which means that the blood-brain barrier is already breached. So allowing the chance for the Borrelia when it comes 48 hours post, an easy access to the brain or central nervous system. So that's where we are going. But I wanted to see, uh, we are doing animal model studies, small animal models. We don't do anything with humans, but I know you have the patient population. So I was kind of wondering from that angle. Yeah, yeah, really. It's a really important question and hasn't been looked at much at all. And just studying the flaviviruses is really important. And there's cross-reactivity among the flavivirus tests. So that gets confusing as well. Thank you. Just want to quickly comment on that. Like I've always had that concern because we never test for Powassan unless somebody's coming in with encephalitis. Yeah, I, I don't do it either. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's a flavivirus and you think about kind of the classic flavivirus that we see in global health, uh, dengue fever. There's, there are these classic uh, iceberg type uh, graphs where you have, you know, a big triangle where the very tippy top, where the, you have the very most severe patients, there's a very small percentage. And as you kind of work your way down, you have less intense symptoms. And then you have a huge area at the bottom of people who potentially are completely asymptomatic. I've always wondered, and that Wisconsin study made me think, there's probably more Powassan out there that we're seeing or we're not seeing that, you know, potentially could be doing something like what you said, so. Yeah. Raise a hand for Dr. Fallon. And if not, I did notice a lot of people today and yesterday uh, taking uh, cell phone pictures of the slides as they came up certain time. But Tina, who's going to come up here next, assures me, and maybe she'll give you further assurance that all of